recording. Brilliant. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, week 35 of the Safari Khabarah. Thank you all for making it this week. I have a question. I have a question, Sina. Go for it. When why do we do week? Why do we mention the week? I know. Go on. When? I want to know. <laughs> when do we stop mentioning the week? Yeah. Are we going to be like? Are we going to be like? This is week seven hundred. I, I I don't know. I, I I think I think it's it's a good reference point. People can be like, "Did you catch week twenty two? Did you catch week fifty five? I think there's something to it. Ad biat Mashiach. <laughs> We're going to say Mashiach came in seven nine three of the Safari Habura. This exactly. is it. This is it. Mitzvah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we look. You can make an executive decision, Ralph. I know I can, but I don't like to make so executive decisions unless I absolutely have to. Teamwork is always the name of the game. Well, welcome to 23rd of February 2021's uh, Habara, everybody. Thanks for making it. Uh, uh, we are actually almost, I think we received this two more essays we're waiting on for the second edition of Principles, our quarterly journal. Um, we've got about 20 essays. In this edition of the journal, uh, the vast majority of them are from our teachers and you know, guest contributors, and then we've got some from the students. Every quarter, we're going to be alternating. The first one was predominantly students and just a couple of the teachers. This one, we predominantly teachers and then a few students, and then it will alternate. So, really looking forward to that. That should be out next month in time for Pesach. Um, please all make sure you attend next week for uh, Rafaur's uh, how to study in a sug how to how to study a sugya the Andalusian way, starting next week. Well, I know a lot of people have been expressing their excitement for that. Um, and tonight, we're honored to have the Rosh Padmit Rosh back to give us some insights on Amalek and existentialism. Rav, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Rabsina. Thank you, everyone. So this is the kind of thing that people think, well, oh, are we going to shoehorn Amalek into existentialism? And, uh, you know, do some kind of nice, uh, you know, mental acrobatics. You will be the judge. You will be the judge. My, my, my thought around this is that I am not saying, nor am I suggesting, that Amalek were existentialists in the modern sense of the term. I do, however, think that the, the way that the Torah and that the Hachamim view Amalek, and it's important because the Torah says things that could be construed in many ways, but the Hachamim seem to see them in very specific ways, can be seen, Amalek can be seen as the progenitors, if you will, the, the early prototypical thinkers that would set a course that would be recognized as part of the family of existentialism. And so what I'm really going to do tonight is not to make a case that they were existentialists. I'm simply going to put out some of the patterns that we see with regards to Amalek and what it tells us about the nature of their view of the world, again, as the Hachamim understand them. And why that has to do per se with Purim, right? Why are they central characters or why is Haman a central character in Purim? And Hachamim definitely recognize him as being related to Amalek. And um, the, the understanding of how it is that we, Israel, deal with them. How it is that, you know, their way of thinking um, addresses us in our lives. So that's what we're going to do tonight, right? And um, I have, I'll show you some sources as we go, as we go ahead. The first thing that I'm going to do in the source sheet is I'm going to read you an excerpt from The Passion of the Western Mind by Richard Tarnas. Um, there are many, many, I mean, if you want to read a book on existentialism that is easily digestible, and by easily, I mean, I'm using that loosely, um, as opposed to reading the massive tomes of Sartre and so on, I would suggest um, a book called How to Be an Existentialist by um, his last name is Cox, C-O-X. I'm trying to remember what his first name is. I will tell you what his first name is. Let me move because my book is on the bookshelf. Yeah, Gary Cox. Um, I recommend that. 
I recommend that as a starter, as a primer, to be able to have a sense of, you know, what existentialists think and how it is that they engage with the world. Um, so let's have a look and dive in over here to be, to be able to kind of get our heads around this. So Tarnas writes as follows. He's writing about the development of um, the emergence out of the Enlightenment and that the Enlightenment you know, turned on its head pretty much everything that we knew about the world. And as we were emerging from that, he says, nowhere was the problematic modern condition more precisely embodied than in the phenomenon of existentialism. When he says modern, he's talking about post-Enlightenment. A mood in philosophy expressed in the writings of Heidegger, Sartre, Camus, among others, but ultimately reflecting a pervasive spiritual crisis in modern culture. The anguish and alienation of 20th century life were brought to full articulation as the existentialist addressed the most fundamental naked concerns of human existence. So existentialists are called existentialists because they are looking at the nature of existence, namely suffering and death, loneliness and dread, guilt, conflict, spiritual emptiness, and ontological cosmic absurdity. Man was condemned to be free, right? So freedom is a major tenet of existentialism. Um, things existed simply because they existed and not for some higher or deeper reason, right? So existentialists look only at what it is that exists that they can recognize exists. And that includes questions around time, because when we talk about time, what really exists regarding time? Well, not the past or the future. But then again, there is no now. So how do we deal with that? I'm not giving in class an existentialism tonight, but I am going to point out that existentialists recognize a world that is void of meaning in and of itself. So they are, for all intents and purposes, nihilists as much as any human being really can be called a nihilist because you know at the end of the day we do have to organize ourselves and we organize ourselves without even realizing that we organize ourselves i mean if you're a nihilistic group and you have a and you have a website it's over yeah you've already sold out <laughs> so there, it's important to understand but when we say nihilism we're in this sense what we're saying is is that there is no recognition of objective meaning in the world and the reason why that is the case, as far as the existentialists are concerned, is because there is no meaning that can be imposed from the outside of the world, because there is no real outside. We know nothing about what is outside of our own existence or the existence. And that's not to say that existentialists do not recognize an objective existence. They are not solipsists. They do not believe that only their own mind exists and what they perceive in their own mind exists. That is not true for the majority of them. Existentialists recognize an objective reality, they just don't recognize what we put onto that reality to be part of that reality on an existential level. And what that means is that if I talk about a cup as a cup, I only know it as a cup because I have a relationship to it as a cup. But in the world on its own as it is, it does not exist as anything other than whatever it is that this is, but I can't really define it because I define it based on my perception and my relationship to it. If I were to break this cup, it would not be a broken cup because it would just be pieces of whatever it is that the substance is. The cup that it used to be is in its history and is only existing in my memory, not as it itself. So I'm not gonna go into depth of that. It's just to orient you in the nature of the thinking, yes? So existentialists, I believe definitely have some relationship to ancestor to to at least philosophical ancestry to Amalek. Again, as Hachamin put out, the nature of how it is that Amalek sees the world. Now, I will say that Amalek does not are not atheists, nor are existentialists uh, necessarily atheists. In other, in other words, to be an existentialist does not necessarily mean that one does not believe in a god. What it does mean is one does not believe in a God that cares or is in any way engaged in personal interactions that provide meaning, nor does God look at a world as something that is worth paying attention to. Yeah, and so once you come to a God like that, you think, well, I mean, who really needs him? It's not, you know, whether he does or doesn't exist, it's not my business. 
because he doesn't necessarily interact with this world. And so therefore there is no meaning. And the reason there's no meaning is because meaning is imposed by context and the context must be on the outside. And therefore there is no real meaning in this world. And so what does an existentialist tell you? Well, you are absolutely fundamentally free. There's nobody that can take that away from you. And as Victor, Victor Frankl says, right, who was also, he's an existentialist. He's one of the better ones in my opinion, but he's an existentialist nonetheless. And what he points out is, is that every freedom can be taken away from you except one. Your choice as to how to relate or to respond to whatever circumstance you find yourself in. So we are fundamentally free as far as the existentialists are concerned in that sense. What they do suggest is that doesn't stop you from being able to put meaning on two things as you see them. And that's enough, which I think is absurd, but nonetheless, it's enough, they say. The reason I think is absurd is not because that it's not, is not because that that's not something that a person can do. But the reality is, is that deep down inside, we know that we're doing it. We know that we're the puppet masters. We know that on the, at the bottom of all things is absolute meaningless. This. And when we are alone in bed, dark at night, in the quiet moments of twilight or dusk, we remember that cold emptiness and it haunts us. So Amalek lived in that world. Amalek lived in a cold, indifferent world. They believed that God did not pay attention that the world was for all intents and purposes random therefore, and that you better beat the odds if you are going to live in this world because the odds are not necessarily in your favor. And when we talk about randomness, you can already recognize that of course Purim has everything to do with this because who calls a festival lotteries? I mean, that's what we call it. The poor is the goral, right? I mean, there is Pasuk, yeah? Where is that Pasuk? Here. They threw a lottery. They cast a lottery. Who calls a fe- I mean, we could have called this festival a hundred other things. But no, we decide to call it lotteries. And that's not, and we don't even call it anti-Purim, right? We call it Purim. We like the idea of the lottery. We want this lottery to be part of what it is that we think. So as with every single Galut and as with every interaction that we have had with a nation other than us that has been intimate and personal, and this is definitely intimate and personal, we've learned something from them. People think that Galut is just a penalty box and nothing could be further from the truth. Galut is a learning experience because we were failing the way that we were doing it on our own before we went into Galut. And so we have to go out and learn. That's why we're not, you know, exiled into backwater countries. I mean, obviously, if we're being conquered, we're not being conquered by weak people, but nonetheless. It's God saying, you go learn from them and learn to incorporate the valuable elements of their their thinking, their society into you, because you are the only ones that will outlast them. And somehow it will need to find its place inside you. But I digress. So we understand that the existentialists see a world without meaning, essentially, therefore, are considered to be nihilists, that they find the world to be chaotic and random, and that there is an indifferent, cold, dead universe that we live in. And the only way that you might feel better about it, feel better about it psychologically, emotionally, is for you to find some kind of meaning that you can live with. Frankel creates an entire therapy around this. He calls it logotherapy, training people to find meaning in their lives. So how do we know that Amalek thinks this way? It's a nice idea that I'm throwing onto them. And how do I know that they think this way? Well, I'm going to show you how it is that I think that they think this way and how Hachamim essentially put it. There's one thing that I'm going to tell you And that is, and I will show you this. Unfortunately, I have to get this from an email, which I didn't have an opportunity today to do because literally I've been from thing to thing today. And that is this, that Bil'am was the mentor of Amalek. There's a Midrash 
that says it, that Bil'am was a mentor of Amalek. It's interesting, I'll tell you that. I had seen that Midrash years and years ago, and I could not find it for the life of me. And I was searching all over for it. And I gave a similar lecture at Limud this year, and I mentioned in front of the 400 and some odd people that were at that lecture <laughs> that I cannot find this midrash, but I know that it, I saw it. And thank goodness, you know, it's like crowdsourcing and, and uh, you know, open-ended, open-sourcing uh, technologies. I said it in front of 400 people and they found the midrash for me <laughs> and they sent it. So I do have the midrash, which I, if, you know, at the end of Shiur, if you want, I'll take a moment to pull up. But nonetheless, the Hachamim definitely see Bil'am as a mentor, so to speak to the mindset of Amalek. And that's why I'm going to bring Bil'am a little bit here. I'm not focusing everything on Bil'am. We're going to look at Amalek. But I want to start with that. And I want to start with this pasuk, because it's a very strange pasuk in Shemot. God said to Moshe, Israel, tell the people that they're stiff-necked. And the reality is, in a moment, I'm, I'm telling you, get me at the wrong moment. God is saying to Moshe, I will wipe you out if I am within you. Notice that it says, I, if I'm in you, if I am connected to you, if I am paying attention to you, as opposed to living up in my heavens indifferent to you, I'm telling you, you are a stiff-necked people and I will find a situation in which you push me the wrong way and it will be the wrong time at the wrong moment and I will wipe you out. So we've got problems. So this is an issue that God is putting before Moshe, which is genuinely a problem. I mean, you know, God saying here that he can't control himself, so to speak, or that he's not willing to necessarily control himself because Israel might run rub him the wrong way and he'll get angry in a moment, a rega, right? And he'll wipe them out. So the Hakamim want to want to explore this because it's not the only place that God says rega in a moment I could wipe you out so lay low there's another pasuk that says habi kimat rega al yavor zam hide for rega so that my anger passes so the hachamim ask this they say in in Masech Berachot they're in the middle of a conversation here and they're saying you know God is at different hours, different things, which in itself is a very interesting conversation because God's not supposed to change, but we're not getting into the deep depth of that conversation. Now, we'll suffice it to say that in our experience of God, that's how it looks. And so the Gemara stops for a minute and says, wait a minute, he gets angry. Is there anger before God? Oh, in, yes, says the Gemara. The Tanya, I mean, we have a Baraita that mentions a Pasuk, the Pasuk says, El Zoraim Bechol Yom. God rages every day. And the Baraita says, Kama Zamo. And well, how much is this rage? Meaning, how long does this rage last for? Rega. Just a moment. Well, how do you know it's only for a moment? Kama Rega. They give a little bit of a, you know, a, a splicing of time over here. And they say that this Rega, in Kol Bria Yechola Lechaven Otasha'a. There's not a human being alive not really a creature alive, that is able to detect that moment, can we let this person in? That is able to detect when that rega is, except for one, Bilam ben Be'or. Bilam is the only one. He really did know what was going on. So the Gemara says, I don't understand. You're telling me this is a man who couldn't understand this donkey. He's going to understand what's going on with God? Look, he knew how to do that. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. That he knew. He could figure out when God was getting angry. Why could he figure out when God was getting angry? I'm going to stop so I can look at you and then we'll go back to it. How did, how did he figure that out? Because there's no telling. It's not like it's the same time every single day. We just know that the, 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 the infinite nature of God allows for that to happen in very sp specific, minute times. So I'm going to tell you something about Bilam. 
Bilam was a very special man. The Achamim say about Bilam, I'm not going through all of the Midrashim in, inside over here because we're concerned with time. But I guarantee you, you want them, I'll send them to you, you look them up yourself. It's important to know. Bilam was a very special man. The Hachamim say that there was no one like Moshe Rabbeinu in the entire world except for one man. And that was Bilam. Not in terms of his attributes and his refined character, because Bilam was not necessarily a refined character. But he spoke to God like Moshe did. On demand. And what that means, Moshe spoke on demand. Bilam wasn't always able to call God. He had to wait until God happened upon him. But when he did speak to God, he spoke to him in full consciousness. Which is astonishing. Because nobody does that. Moshe is the only one. No, none of our Nevi'im outside of Moshe were able to do that. So the Hachamim list the similarities and differences between Moshe and Bil'am. And they say that the reason why Bil'am was able to do this was because Bil'am did not take anything for granted when it came to reality. He read nothing into reality. And what that means is he accepted completely, which is one of the most difficult things for any of us to accept because we are not wired this way. But he accepted completely that the world was absolutely random and that any patterns that we detected in the world happened here and here only. And so he trained himself out of that thinking. Yes? He trained himself out of the thinking. So just because I ate something for lunch yesterday doesn't mean that it has any bearing on what it is that I want to do today. Just because I said something yesterday doesn't have any bearing on what it is that I want to say today. Just because I did something yesterday doesn't have any bearing on what it is that I do today because nothing connects those two moments except for the memory in my mind. Do you hear me? There is nothing that connects one moment in this world to the next, except my mind. Do you follow? And that being the case, Bil'am recognized that time was a construct. And that the connection and patter patternings of moments in time, actions in time, occurrences in time, were all not existential, but perceived, and therefore not fundamentally real. And because they were not fundamentally real, he believed that they were not important. He was wrong, but that's what he believed. And therefore, and this is the crazy part, he was able to talk to God. Because included in the understanding of the existential reality that I, as a human being, tend to project onto that reality all manner of belief and interpretation, Bil'am did everything that he could to suspend that. And he aimed as much as he could to see the world in the most objective manner that he could. So he didn't worship Abu Dazara. And the reason he didn't worship Abu Dazara is because he didn't create gods out of his mind. And he didn't project those gods onto reality. And he didn't bow to them. He's the only non-Israel who calls God Adonai Elohai. Yudke Vavke, my Lord. It's shocking, but that's him. Now, he doesn't for one minute think that God actually cares about this world. Why would he? Nor does he care about Bilam. Why would he? So there are no patterns. There's none of that. But because Bilam is able to suspend his projected subjectivity to the highest degree, God talks to him. Moshe later on tells God, you can't do that anymore. But for a good while, God talks to Bilam when he feels like it, haphazardly. There's no relationship, by the way, right? God doesn't have a relationship with Bilam. He's not invested in Bilam, and nor does Bilam expect for him to be invested in him. 
And at the same time, Bilam does not expect that God should not change his mind. Just because God said something yesterday doesn't mean that he can't say something completely different than the opposite today. For all intents and purposes, he's God. And that means nothing encumbers him. He follows no rules whatsoever. Why should he? And that's why nobody understands the story. Take a look at the story. It's the most, uh, once you recognize that this is what Bilam is about and how he sees the world, the story about Bilam and the way that God talks to him is perfectly understandable. Because God plays into Bilam's whole sense of the world. He plays you. You don't think that I pay attention to the world? You're right. I don't pay attention to the world. Why should I? I mean, you know, I have much better things to do than to pay attention to some arbitrary, minuscule rock in the middle of nowhere with some biped meat brains walking on the top of it. Okay, it's a nice, you know, uh, outcome of some little project that I had going on. You interest me, Bilam, today, you know. And then I'll tell you. So look what happens. So Bilam's sitting there. Balak bin Sipor wants to curse Israel because he's scared to death in them. And he sends all of his mentors to Bilam to be able to curse them because he's trying, everybody else tried warfare, it didn't work. So he's trying to tr do some other things. And I love this language. So what happens? God comes to Bilam. And he goes, Who are these guys that are with you? And it's interesting because Bilam doesn't turn to God and say, God, please. You're God. You don't know who these people are. No, he says, oh, I'll tell you. Uh, these people, the king of uh, Moab sent them to me. I don't know if you heard, but this nation just came out of Egypt. I mean, they're, they're just like covering the whole world, you know. So he wanted me to... He wanted me to curse them so that maybe he'll be able to find some vulnerabilities in that curse and be able to, to fight them and defeat them. So God listens to all this. He goes, okay, I don't go with them. Don't curse them. It's a blessed nation. So Bilam, I mean, it's like completely arbitrary discussion. So Bilam goes to them the next day. He said, look, in the morning, he says, look, I spoke to God. God said, I can't go. And I told you, if God tells me something directly, I can't go against it. You know, God doesn't always talk to me. Sometimes he cares, sometimes he doesn't. In this particular case, he decided to come to me and talk to me. He said, though, sorry. I mean, I don't care how much you pay me, says Bilam. I, once God talks to me directly, I can't go against that. Okay, so they send more messengers and whatever over to Bilam. And then all of a sudden, God says to him the next day, he says, yeah, okay, go, but do what I tell you. That's not shocking to Bilam. He doesn't say, what do you mean? You just told me yesterday. Well, okay, today you change your mind. You're God. You get to do that. I don't, you know, whatever. You understand? You follow. That's the way you read the story. And that's why, and the, here we get into the key word. It says, Vaikar Elohim il Bilam. God happened upon Bilam and said to him, This is the way that God talks to Bilam by car. It's a mikre. Where have we heard that before? You just read Parashat Zachor, you know, either at home or in synagogue or however it is that you heard it. And we said that Amalek came to Israel and the problem with Amalek is that Asher Karecha Baderech. They just happened upon you. These haphazard animals these people that live in a world that is completely random and indifferent to them. Interestingly, and it's important to recognize that the word for cold in Hebrew is kar. And that's not a, some weird coincidence, right? This is Lashon Kodesh. The relationship between words is very important. So the root kar, which is cold, which is quite concrete, ends up manifesting in, in, in its relationship to indifference, which also we will call in our vernacular a cold behavior. Because indifference is certainly not warm. And so the word mikre is a word that signifies haphazardness, indifference, a lack of mattering, meaninglessness. So that's how God relates to Bilam because that's how Bilam relates to God. 
Notice that Vaikra is a very different thing. And anybody who knows the Vaikra of Vaikra, meaning the first Vaikra of Sefer Vaikra, has a very small Aleph. When you look at it from afar, you can't even see the Aleph. It looks like God happened upon Moshe in the way he happened upon Bilam. And the only difference is an Aleph, which turns it completely around. Because isn't the calling of God to Moshe the antithesis of the happening of God upon Bilam? Something to think about for later. So here it is, right? This is Amalek. They just happened upon you. They are random people. They live in a random world. They are completely indifferent. They do not fear or have reverence for God because they don't think that God has anything to do with the world for that matter. It's why there is a Midrash, which I didn't include over here, that says that the only ones that Amalek attacked were those that were not covered by the Ananea Kabod. Because they said, look, if God's protecting people, God's protecting people. Okay, fine. But the ones he's not protecting, he's not protecting. They didn't believe that God had any intentions of investing in this people. So what does that imply? As far as this concept is concerned, what it implies is that Amalek believed, like Bil'am their Rebbe, that God was not involved with this world and that the world was random and that the patterns that people see in the world are only pa patterns that people see in the world, but they can't have too much meaning. And that meaning is a threat and undermines everything. And when you have a nation that is coming out into a world that is putting everyone on edge, right? And think about it. What does Israel do? It's till today, it's the same thing. This is the root, in my opinion, of anti-Semitism without question. You can explain it politically as much as you want. It's all a bunch of nonsense. There is one bottom line root to anti-Semitism, and that is that we don't go away. And the reason we don't go away is because we have a covenant with God. And that freaks people out. It freaks us out, and it freaks everybody else out. That's the bottom line. Everything else that is put on top of that is all a facade. The reality is, why do you think Israel is such a focus? It's very simple why it's such a focus. You're telling me that this is a people, first of all, that started 3,000 years ago as a people, okay? They've been thrown off their land. They've been roaming around the world for 2,000 years with their hands tied behind their backs, burned at every single situation. And then you tell me 2,000 years later, they get to come back after we tried to destroy them utterly. I mean, I don't know. No. So after what happens, they come back home to the same address. You dig into that earth and everything that you find in it has our name written all over it. They come back to the same address and establish a sovereign government called Israel. You have to be in a complete coma not to recognize that that is the scariest thing to ever happen in recent history. People shouldn't be shuddering in their boots when the Jews come back home like that. And then like, you know, you give them, so what are they there for 70 years? 70 some odd years, not even a full human lifetime. They should just be getting out of the gate. No, they're on the cutting edge of technology and development and, and startups and, and creativity and, and what have you. It's not threatening. It's not threatening. It's threatening to us and it's threatening to everybody else if we call a spade a spade. Doesn't mean that people should hate anything. Doesn't mean that people need to annihilate anything. I mean, people look, it's wonderful to be able to work together. But that's a reality that is there on the world stage without question. And so for the Jewish people, for many of us, it's too big a weight to bear. It's too strong a signal for us to look at straight in the eye. And for the rest of the world, it's one that makes everything extremely uncomfortable because we don't go away. So 
when Amalek watched us walk out of Egypt the way that we did, it wasn't that we don't go away. It was that everybody was completely stunned. When we say in the Az Yashir Moshe every single day, Shema'u Amimir Gazun, Hila Az Yoshev Pelaj, they were shuddering. People couldn't handle the fact that how was Egypt defeated and this people are walking out if the story is told as we have it in the Torah with pillar of fire by night and pillar of cloud by day. You're not going to reel back from this people. So you all, you have to have a terrorist group called Amalek who decide whatever's going on over there, people really should get over because it's a minor local, you know, random fluke. But it's not all the stuff that people are putting on to it. The Jews really aren't that important. So let's tone everything way down. And we'll bring everything way down. Put out the fire. We'll cool it all off, which is exactly what they do. Another way to read that is they cooled you down as you were coming out of Egypt. Indeed, they did. They made us very uncomfortable <laughs> when they did what they did. We had tremendous problems of self-confidence and self, self-assurance self after that happened, which is precisely what terrorism is meant to do. It's not meant to destroy you physically. It's meant to destroy you mentally, emotionally, and psychologically. So were they existentialists in the sense of Sartre and Camus? Maybe they weren't that sophisticated, but they certainly were the progenitors because they definitely saw a world that did not have any inherent meaning in it. And that anybody who put on meaning, put meaning onto the world should know that they were putting meaning onto the world, that fundamentally the world is not meaningful. They were not as benevolent as Frankel. They were not encouraging people to put meaning into your own life. No, they were saying, please, stop it. Get a grip. Things aren't as important as you think. As a matter of fact, they're not important at all. And once you recognize that, if you want to put importance onto things for your own sake, well, then fine, but don't impose it on other people. And Israel certainly is imposing importance on other people. They're saying that they are cosmically important. No. And that is why there is this war between God and Amalek, so to speak. Because what we're told later on, at least in terms of Bilam, what Bilam learns, and Amalek has yet to learn, is that God actually did care about investing in a relationship. And that he actually did encumber his own freedoms in order to be invested in that relationship. It's one of the most powerful psukim of the whole Torah, in my opinion. If I could say such a thing, so to speak. Moshe tells the people before he dies, he goes, you know, Bilam wanted to destroy you. And the reality is, he should have been able to. The Gemara says explicitly, he should have been able to. And the only reason that he wasn't able to is because God didn't want to listen to him. And the only reason God didn't want to listen to him is for this. Because he loves you. I was just speaking to a friend of mine, an in, in, in imam, who I'm friendly with today. And I shared some thoughts around Torah with him. And he said, you know, I'm so shocked because there's such a central focus on love in the Torah. I thought that it's just, you know, a thing that tells people how to live in proper civility and and law and, and so on and so forth. I didn't realize that love was such a big part of it. I said, love is the whole underpinning of everything in the Torah. Every day is our catechism. And here what it's saying is, is that yes, for all intents and purposes, and this is important, Amalek are right about the way that they see the world in its default sense. But I have chosen to love you. And because I've chosen to love you, I will encumber my freedoms in order to be able to invest in that love. And even if Bil'am knows the right time, I will shut my ears to him because I have invested in a covenant in love with you and nothing will tear that asunder. 
And that can be filled in with anything. Lo a hundred things. Why ki But it is also what I said before is very important. Amalek are correct about what they say regarding the world. The existentialists are not far off about what they say about the world and its meaning. If there is not an externally imposed context to the world, we cannot say that anything in it has fundamental meaning. We can say that we impose meaning onto it, but we can't say that it has fundamental meaning unless there is an external meaning provider. So we recognize that Israel says, well, that's God. And that's only because God cares. Not because he is, but because he is and cares. Because if he doesn't care, then there is no meaning outside of its, ex its existence. So he created it. Doesn't mean he cares about it. And that's a very important fundamental for Israel as well. Just because God knows doesn't mean that God cares. Those are two fundamentally different things. God's knowledge does not equal his care. That's earned. And so what Amalek is saying is that the default is such. And that is why, by the way, that when Bil'am talks about Amalek, which he does, before he goes in his last, you know, swan song, Bayarat Amalek, he says, and Bil'am saw Amalek, and he opened up his, his parable and said, Reshit Goyim Amalek. Amalek is chief of nations. They're at the top because they're only ones that see things clearly and objectively. Everybody else is projecting their nonsense realities onto the world, not Amalek. Problem is, the problem is at the end, they're all going to go away. The reason for that is because everything is entropic and the world itself will go away. And unless God has a personal relationship with things and God is invested in things, why wouldn't they go away? Of course they do. So do what you, you know, do what you will with the time that you've got. Unless, of course, you don't go away. Which is another kettle of fish. And you end up lasting for thousands of years. So how does all of this run with regards to Purim? Well, the first thing is, is that on Purim, we actually learned to pay serious attention to what Amalek had to say. Because like I say, they weren't wrong about the default of the world. And for that matter, the mode in which God runs things. Because God is not a mechanic. He doesn't put the world together like blocks of Lego. Lo machshavotai machshavotichem. The way that I think is not the way that you people think, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Your ways are not my ways. I don't do things like you. I'm God. I have a million ways to skin a cat. So yes, as David HaMelech wrote, God's goal will be achieved no matter what. How? Well, that's entirely open. It all depends on what makes itself available to God in the process of these things. So what does Megillat Esther teach us? The first thing that Megillat Esther teaches us is that God doesn't need to peek through the curtains constantly to stick his hand into things in order to be able to manipulate them to his will. It's enough for him simply to will reality as it is, because it will always come to his will. That's number one. Haman knew that, and Mordechai knew that. That they shared. The difference was that if God is flowing in the world, can you connect to that? Can you tap into that, for lack of a better term? Can you know God? And by knowing God, we mean, can you have a relationship with God, an interaction with him? 
Can you become part of the flow? Haman didn't believe that you could, as his ancestors didn't believe that you could, and not because it was impossible, because it just wasn't available. When God wanted to, he did. When he didn't, he didn't. What Mordechai knew was precisely what he told Esther. Esther, we're the Jews. We're not going anywhere. Don't think for one minute you are saving the Jews. If it's not you, it'll come from elsewhere. There may be casualties. It may not be as clean and triumphant, but I guarantee you the Jews, this is not the last day of the Jewish people on earth. I promise you that. It's the only thing that I really can promise you because everything else, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's basically what Mordecai says to us there. And that was the only difference. Haman decided, look, we have no idea where things are going. We can kind of look at trends. And that's why Zerah says, look, uh, I mean, look, I, I just heard that you took him out on a horse. I'll tell you something. It's not looking good. The, pat, you know, the, the pattern, the trend of the markets right, for, for you, Haman, is just not looking good. And if he's from the Zera Yehudim and you have your whole vendetta against them and you had to just walk him through the town on a horse, I hate to tell you, it's curtains. And that's just in terms of trends. Trends. Mordechai recognizes that. The only difference between Mordechai and Haman in that is that he recognizes that Israel has a hevecha Adonai Ruecha. He knew what Bilam learned at the very end. No, I didn't listen to Bilam. And the reason I didn't listen to Bilam is because I love you. And because I'm committed to you throughout all of history. Because I promised your grandfather that I would. And because I reestablished my covenant with you at Har Sinai. And because I bound myself into keeping you, come what may. So exactly as Mordechai said, if you, Esther, are not ready to do this. So then what's the difference? You notice that everything that Haman prepared for his grandeur was used against him. According to the Achamim, Mimuchan is Haman. So he decided, let's get rid of Ashti. Good, you got rid of Ashti, and who took her place? Esther. Yeah, well, that wasn't good for you. And then, of course, you know, you thought, let's do this uh, lottery, you know, and get Mordechai and his entire people in trouble. Well, Mordechai, you know, he is around the king's court, and he does have his ear to the ground, and he did hear about Biktan and Teresh, and that ended up being a real not nuisance for you. And then, of course, that gallows that you set up for Mordechai. All used against you, Haman. That's why the Hachabim say, when you read in the Megillah, Asher Hechin Lo, that in the Pshat he was pre prepared for Mordechai, you should read it with emphasis, Lo, thinking that it was for Haman. He prepared it for himself. Because in a world that flows in God's will, everything that you want for your own will that is against his will work against you. But as far as Mordechai was concerned, he had no idea where things were going specifically. He knew that the Jews would be okay, but he had no idea where things were going specifically. And that's why we have these very interesting pesukim. Every day Mordechai would go past the harem to see how Esther was, what was going with her, what was going on with her. Why isn't he in shul? Forgive me for saying shul. Right? Why? Why isn't he praying? Why isn't he in the Beit Midrash studying Torah to save her? No, what he's doing is he's looking to see where things are moving. What's the trend? I want to know where things are going. And then he says to Esther later on, he says, look, the truth of the matter is, mi odeya im kazoti gatla malchut. Sounds like a crazy statement. I mean, were you blind? He says, her, look, Esther, 
I have no idea if this is the reason why you became queen. <laughs> uh, what do I know? I don't know what God's plans are. I can tell you this is a phenomenal opportunity, that for sure. And if you're quiet now, well, the Jews will be okay. And here is the key. Listen carefully. If the case is that the world, for all intents and purposes, has very random ways that it comes into God's desire, right? God's endpoint. At that, in the end of the day, it's going to get there. Well, then what's my place in all of it? Well, there's only one question to any of us, which is what we learn on Purim. Do you want to be part of it or not? Are you interested in going into that flow and being a clear end individual entity that is instrumental in bringing things forward or not? How does one do that? You have to know God and you have to know you and you have to choose your life in line with how it is that God made you. Does that seem abstract? Well, think about what it is that Mordechai says to us there. He says to us there, look, the Jews will be okay, regardless of what you do. At ubet avich tovedu. You and your father's household will disappear with you. You, Esther, will fall into the backdrop because you have an opportunity here to do something that is staring you in the face that only you can do that has your name written all over it you can choose not to and we will get out of this in one way or another but if you choose not to that's the last we're going to hear of you because you will fall into the randomness of it all a blip on the screen so Esther hears that and she says, well, if it's about me, it's about my identity, my life, my actions, tsumu alai, tell everybody to fast for me. I'm going in. And that's exactly what we do. It's ta'anit Esther. Like Karambam holds, not how the Mishnah Berurah holds. There's an argument among the Achamim as to what ta'anit Esther today commemorates. And by the way, it's the only fast that's commemorative. All the other fasts are still trying to fix things that were broken. Ta'anit Esther was addressed. We fast as a commemoration. In solidarity. Says Harambam, what is Ta'anit Esther commemorating? Ha'ta'anit shi ta'anu bime Haman, says Harambam. The fast that they fasted in the days of Haman which can't be the fast that they fasted a year later before they went to war, which is what the Mishnah Berurah says. Because Haman was dead for a year by that time. She says, fast for me. I'm going in. And yes, it ends up being Megillat Esther and Ta'anit Esther and Purim. But that's what it teaches us. It teaches us that the flow of this life is running in a very particular fashion. It is going in the way that God commanded it to go at the very beginning. And it's finding its way. And you and I can be part of it or not. But it isn't mechanical. And it isn't going to pose it, impose itself upon you. You either choose it or you don't. You either step up and be what it is that you were created to be or you don't. Things will be fine without you and me, but they, your name will not be on it. Your presence, your life will have been a part of the backdrop. So the example that I give for this is a very crude one and a very simple one, but I nonetheless find it effective. It's like a bird's nest. I don't know if anybody has ever seen a bird's nest up close. I have more than once, you look at a bird's nest from afar and it looks like a bird's nest. 
It's a bunch of twigs that are woven into a very fascinating shape. I mean, it's fascinating that birds can do this in the first place, you know, but they do, they, they weave these things and lay their eggs and sit on these nests. But if you've ever seen one up close, you recognize that it's made of very strange things. I've seen birds nests with rubber bands woven inside, gum wrappers. I've seen string that's been taken from bakery boxes, shoelaces. My point is the nest is going to get made. That bird is going to make a nest come hell or high water. The only question is, is what is it going to use to make that nest? And the answer is whatever is available. And so in a sense, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to make his world. It's going to get made one way or another. What will he use? Whatever is available or whomever is available. And it is up to us to make ourselves available if we wish to. Amalek says rubbish, all nonsense, all projections of your mind. And you tell me, is that not what we deal with in the modern world on a daily basis every single day? To the point that we are embarrassed to speak of a covenant that we hold with God, even though we have been around for over 3,000 years and we came back home after 2,000 years of being away and we've established a sovereign state and we are still here, prominent Jews, members of the nation of Israel, and yet we're embarrassed. We aren't sure. Not clear to us whether the book that we hold so dear is really that important. It's only a book that has completely changed the face of the entire world that should never have been heard of. It belonged to one minuscule arbitrary Hebrew tribe on some microscopic strip of land on the globe. No. Suddenly the Bible has completely changed the entire way that at least the Western world thinks, but certainly with by this time, with the mingling of thought, It's just so silly. But Amalek persists and says that the world is meaningless. And that there probably is no God. And that even if there is, he doesn't really care about what you have for lunch or whom you sleep with or anything. So get over it. And the problem is, is that unless one builds a relationship with God, and that, by the way, is open to every single human being that has a brain in their head. It's true that Israel has covenant. But a relationship, close, connected, meaningful relationship with God is available to every single human being that has a brain in, 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 in their head. It's all connected to consciousness and awareness and meaning. So yes, Amalek is right in the default sense, but they're stupid because they have amazing opportunities, as do we. And that's what Purim teaches us. Purim says, no, the lottery is real. The randomness is real. It's what gives room for something to be precious, as a matter of fact. Because if everything was precious, then there wouldn't really be preciousness. But when everything is random and something stands out as mattering, as caring, as valuable, that's precious. Do you know what we call precious in Hebrew, in Lashon HaKodesh? Yikar. Layudim hayta orav simcha v'sason vikar. Of course, that's the word you use in this story. It was preciousness, as opposed to keri, which is randomness. Same letters, just turned around. So, were Amalek existentialists? I think they were progenitors. I think that they planted the seeds. I don't think that Sartre and Camus came out with it from thin air. And no, they didn't even have to go back to Amalek to get it because the Greeks spoke such things in prototypical terms. It was in the discourse of humanity. It was in the water from very early on. And it's not a hard thing to get to. 
All it requires is to be able to look at the world objectively for a minute and suspend the projections that we love to get ourselves into, the towers of faux reality that we build for ourselves. Well, Amalek got real. They got hardcore. They're our cousins after all. I mean, you know, they're not far off from us. They're, um, they're Esau's grandchildren. So. Yeah, I don't know. We're at 9.33. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, we've got a question here from Daniel. Daniel Icon in Austin, Texas. I know Daniel Icon in Austin, Texas. Interesting wording of Vaya Foch in the Devarim 23.6 Pasuk in reference to the story of Bilam. And the Megillah, Vena Fochu, yeah. Both Pasukim are this reference of change. Yeah, I think, yeah, change of heart. I think that the concept of Vena Fochu is, is that it's a complete flip of the same story, right? It's not just another ingredient. It's a completely different way of seeing reality. But it's not, it doesn't require a massive shift. It's just a flip. You flip the switch and you see the same thing in different terms and completely redefines everything. Does that make sense, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of more of looking at like just the connection between the two stories and saying the same word. Right. So that's your first step. Daniel. Anytime that you see a word like that and a connection like that, your next question is why? I've seen people write articles that put these connections out so nicely, but then they leave it. <laughs> they don't necessarily answer the question as, well, why? Which is good because it gives us work to do. But I'm suggesting the reasoning for using that word in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, very good question. Thank you for noticing that. Thanks. Nicole Rivera, I think that Hashem wanting a personal relationship with us as his creation is evident in the creation story. Whereas the other stories like Sumerian creation, yes, I think that's a very important point. The whole Torah is based and geared towards that. That's the whole point of the Torah. That's why I said to my Imam friend that it's all based on love at the end of the day. Uh, anybody else got any questions? You can just unmute and ask. Mr. Bechor, it's all yours. Uh, I'm just interested in, um, you, you mentioned that you didn't regard um, Amalek uh, or Bilam, for that matter, as, an, as idolaters. Right. But doesn't our tradition teach us that our real enemy, the, Jew, the Jews' main enemies are, are in fact idolaters? No. No, no interestingly. We are perturbed by them we are irked by them we we are even made to suffer by them because once they start caring about things like god then they realize that they we have the wrong one and that we're competition so it gets to be very uncomfortable for us but we do not see them as arch enemies we see them as problems but not as arch enemies so we can't live with them because they are dangerous for us because we will tend to follow their gods and do things that we're not supposed to do and god doesn't like that but in terms of the fundamental meaning of the world and life, only Amalek. They're the only ones that really hit. Because once we do away with the questions of projection, the only ones that are left are Amalek and us. It's a showdown. And that's part of our tradition, that at the end of the day, it's going to have to be them or us. Either they come onto it or we have to deal with it or whatever it is. But these are not two visions that can live simultaneously. And, and you know find harmony so that that gets down when you get to the brass tacks it's amalek and israel if that makes sense yeah well i think in the follow-up i think it's kind of like what you've been mentioning and this this idea of from a philosophical perspective of randomness versus meaning right mm -hmm. and so those can't those are mutually exclusive you can't both be completely random but then also have meaning within your randomness Correct. so that, for that if amalek believes randomness then we believe diametrically opposed to that concept. Correct. 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 Anybody else? Or are we done? Rav. Yeah. Ah, there we go. When Hashem tells the Bilam not to go, so he explains for they're blessed. So what yeah. is the significance of that? Especially as if Hashem is buying into his own worldview. Yeah, he's no not telling him how or why they're blessed. He's just saying these people happen to be blessed, so don't touch them. He doesn't say, because I bless them and I love them and I have all relationships. No, because he's also setting Bilam up. 
right? He's saying, look, you idiot. You know, I mean, are you so, so insistent on the fact that the world runs in the way that you think that you can't see what's right in front of your eyes that I actually care? So what you're saying, yeah, I mean, ki baruch Well, why are they baruch? Do you think about why they're baruch? No, you don't. You just reckon, okay, they're baruch. Good, okay. Yeah. And at the end, the Rav mentioned that he does, at the end, admit that they are that there is a relationship between uh, God and Israel. He recognizes it, yeah. He Why couldn't he just explain it away and say, well, he likes them for these seven days or for these seven korbanot, but not after that? Because he saw, that's why it says, He didn't go like time after time to sacrifice and to do all kinds of things. He realized, he saw, it says explicitly, he saw that HaKadosh Baruch wanted to bless these people. I was like, okay, what, I'm going to waste my time. I see that there's a pattern over here that God obviously is persisting. So I'm not going to buck that. I'm not, I'm not, you know, a, a kamikaze, you know, suicide pilot. I'm going to recognize that this is not an option for me over here. Thank you. I've just got a question. Why does the concept of blessed and cursed come up when we deal with Malak, Amalek every time? Also in Purim, we say Mordechai is blessed and Haman is cursed. Because blessing implies attention and care, always. You can't bless something randomly. It's the definition of Biracha, right? As a matter of fact, there are Hachamim who point out that Biracha comes from the word Biracha, which is a pool. And so in the pool, you recognize something specific and you single it out as special. That's the idea of Biracha. Otherwise, you're Mekalel. Mekalel means you make light of it. Lashon Kal. Right? You make light of it. It's not important. It's meaningless. That's what a curse is at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to be meaningless or haphazard. Rabbi, can I ask a quick question? Avi. Um, in the discussion, in the in the build-up to the shiur, um, we, uh, someone brought up the Rambam, um, which sort of on Zecher Amalek, on Tim Chet Zecher Amalek, um, the focus of the Rambam seems to be on the Zera, it's sort of a more biological, yeah. the ethnic focus. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that it just, it's a sort of, there's two parallel stories here, there's the ideological component, and then the, there is obviously the historical and, you know, referring specifically to these people. How do they work together, those two? Yeah. Approaches? Well, the first thing is that Rambam definitely understands the mitzvah as being specific to a people right? Not to an ideology. And there is definitely recognition in the Torah that biology is meaningful, right? That's very, very taboo today, especially post the Holocaust. And it's a problem, right? Because it could be extremely adulterated and, and treated in very dangerous ways. But there is a recognition in the Torah that there is a value to biology. And so Harambam understands the mitzvah as essentially if, if there's a matter of getting rid of this, right, in terms of, because there's two mitzvot, right, there's zachor, and then there's timhe, yeah, the zachor is, in, it's important to be able to recognize what were they thinking, what was going on with them, you know, have an understanding of what this is, and then there's timhe, there has, it has to be wiped out, so certainly there is a way to look at it in terms of ideology, because when the ideology, ideology is present, it's not something that we want to be able to maintain, but in terms of war, and even Harambam, when he writes it, he writes it in terms of war. He doesn't say like, you know, if you know that there's an Amalekki standing on the, on the road next to you, that you, you know, you take him out. No, that's not okay according to anybody. Harambam himself only says it in terms of war. The problem is, is that the mitzvah as Harambam establishes it is impossible today because we have absolutely no idea who they are. Right. So that's, I mean, on a practical sense. And so that's not something that we can do. Number one. Number two, I'll say that Rabbi Faur believes uh, this is the one place that he explicitly disagreed with Harambam based on Harambam, <laughs> which is funny because he uses Harambam's principles of counting a mitzvah as what's a mitzvah to disprove Harambam's understanding of the mitzvah, which is a little dubious. But nonetheless, Rabbi Faur says that because Harambam says the only thing that can be counted as one of the mitzvot, is a mitzvah that is eternal or will always be applicable, means that the destruction of Amalek cannot be a mitzvah because once you destroy them, they're no longer there anymore and then you don't have the mitzvah. So that's a problem. And that's something Rabbi Fawur says is, therefore, 
really not the mitzvah. And that's why he writes also elsewhere that the nature of the mitzvah really can't be that. So he actually does disagree with Harambam on that reading. But to look at Harambam, qua Harambam, Harambam definitely recognizes it as being a biological thing and that the people need to be uh, wiped out if there is an opportunity for it at time of war um, under particular circumstances. But it's not a practical thing that can be done today. So I hope that answers it. I think yeah, that's it. good. Okay, thank you all for joining us this week. As I mentioned, next week we're honored to have, we mentioned Hakam Faur, Hakam Faur's son, Rabbi Abe Faur, uh, starting the series on how to study a sugya in Sepharad. Looking forward to seeing you all there on Wednesday. Uh, if you're in the WhatsApp group, you'll get all the information. Rabbi Dirk, thank you again so much for an insightful and helpful sure as Purim is coming up and Purim is coming up to everybody. Purim Sameach. You after on the other side. Purim Sameach. Lovely to see you all and to spend time with you all. Call to. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Thank you.